Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you will all take a seat, uh, those of you who are standing in the doorway, if uh, we, I know we have overflow seating back there in the lobby, so if you'll please take a seat back there. Uh, we're getting really good at this, so thank you. Uh, welcome to the Town of Los Gatos Joint Town Council Parking Authority meeting for June 3rd, 2013. Uh, I will ask you all to put your cell phones on silence or vibrate and ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you and good evening. Council Member Joe Prasinski. Here. Council Member Marsha Jensen. Here. Council Member Diane McNutt. Here. Council, excuse me, Vice Mayor Stephen Leonardis. Here. Mayor and Chair Barbara Spector. Here. As you know, we always have someone from our community, a young person from our community, uh, help us with uh, leading the flag salute. Uh, today we have someone who is very special in the sense of, just wait till you hear her name. I'm going to ask her to come up uh, front with me, Olivia Leonardis. Now, usually we wait until I say, let's give her a hand, but you guys are ahead of me. <laughs> Let me tell you something about Olivia. There's probably some things about her based on her last name that you already know, but there's more to this young woman. She's a fifth grader at Louise, Louise Van Meter Elementary School. She's a member of K-Kids, Kiwanis Youth Organization. She participates in Girls on the Run, both of these groups are involved in community service such as park cleanup. Her favorite subjects are writing, reading, and science. She does gymnastic, gymnastics and dance. She likes art, sewing, cooking, baking, and tennis. She plays the violin. She has played 10 seasons of soccer, all on her dad's team pretty good. I mean, that they lasted 10 seasons, right? And when she grows up, she wants to be a scientist or a dancer or both. <laughs> if you'll please stand. Okay. Ready? So I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's for you. Thank you, Olivia. I 
Another round of applause. I think we have a proud dad up here. I am now going to ask uh, Scott Seaman, Chief Seaman, to join me uh, up front, give him the microphone, uh, and we're going to be doing some uh, commendations and uh, interface with the Youth Commission. Mayor, thank you very, very much. You're actually going to see a couple of iterations of the Youth Commission tonight. The Youth Commission, in their official capacity, grants uh, acknowledgement to businesses in Los Gatos who are youth friendly and have done this now for several years. And there are over 100 businesses in Los Gatos who have been identified as being youth friendly. So I'd like to uh, engage them as uh, partners with me as we recognize the one business this year that has been identified as the youth friendly business of the year. Now, the youth commissioners know that you all wanted a place to sit, so they're kind of tucked away and hidden in corners and standing in the back. So Ben and, and Zoll, if I could ask you to get all current uh, or now uh, uh, this year alumni youth commissioners in, join me up here in the front. They've come back, uh, they're in testing. They've uh, given up on testing to come in and be with you tonight because this is their program and they're very, uh, uh, proud of what they've done. I need you to give the mayor some space so she gets seen. There we go. Uh, ben Baranofsky is the current and actually outgoing uh, chair of the Youth Commission, and I'm going to ask Ben, put him on the spot for just a moment, to make a couple sentence statement about what the Youth Commission's Youth Friendly Business Year uh, Business of the Year means, and to identify the Singh family and Cafe de Flori and invite them up. All right, so pretty much being youth friendly means that the business supports youth in the community. Um, either by hiring youth or by donating to youth sports or organizations. Um, they also cater to youth's needs. So, I mean, kids aren't really going to go buy diamonds. Um, I wish I could. <laughs> um, and they also treat youth res with uh, respect while they're in the, in the store or restaurant. So that means they don't follow them around. They don't stare at them, suspect them of stealing all their stuff. Um, this year, we've chosen Cafe de Flore as our Youth Friendly Business of the Year. Um, and on behalf of the town, I'd like to thank you and your family for having such a friendly business towards youth. And please, please come up. And I had the privilege of witnessing the voting and, and watching the process evolve uh, from 100 businesses. It narrows down to about 10, narrows down to three. They think about it for a month, came back, and of those three, it was clear uh, to everybody on the dais who actually is uh, uh, serving the Youth Commission that your business stood out as the Youth Friendly Business of the Year. And you join now J.J. Magoo's Pizza and Los Gatos Meats as highly regarded and respected businesses for youth in Los Gatos. We're very grateful to you for all that you do. And I, she cares too much about kids. So, would you care to say anything about uh, what you do for youth? Yeah. I first of all, I really appreciate that uh, opportunity to thank you. Uh, I love Las Gatos, <laughs> and I love kids because I have three daughters of my own, and it's just a very nice. Kids are so polite, and they are really friendly. They so they have great manners. I never had touch wood. I never had any problem in the last six years, and I hope I keep the same way. And I, I really thank you very much, and I appreciate all you did, did for us. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Okay, you guys all go take a seat again.
like to talk about service or you want me to manage it? The youth commission is comprised of 15 youth and five alternates. So we have 20 kids here once a month for the business of the town and it's the role of the youth commission to advise council on issues important to and, and concerning youth. And so, um, let me make sure we don't have any more. Uh, every year, as youth commissioners graduate, uh, move on, they uh, finish their term as members of the youth commission, we bring a new crop in. So we actually have some members of the newly appointed youth commission, one that gets acted on tonight, who are here to witness uh, that action and to take pride in the fact they're joining a great group. We just finished, I believe, our seventh year of youth commission and getting ready to launch in eighth. I am proud to serve as the liaison to the youth commission and it's incredibly rewarding personal experience to work with these kids and to see their energy in this youth friendly business plan is uh, one of the I think finest examples of kids taking responsibility and it comes out of uh, kids learning about government and business in relationship to the town in fact taking a personal interest to create an anchor so that kids actually want to be part of the business community in town and so uh, while many of them are in fact studying we have two that are here who get to receive a resolution and we have the same resolution for other children or other youth who have not been able to join us tonight I'll read one for you so that you understand the tone of it and then ask Ben Baranofsky and Zal Moyadin to come back up and receive these. Could you come back up, please? So Mayor, I'll let you present these. This is for Ben. I'll, I'll read Zal's, but uh, Ben's reads essentially the same. Uh, and it is whereas uh, Ben and Zoll serve the town of Los Gatos as a member of the town's youth commission for the term that they served and it's four years for each of their cases. Both unselfishly contributed time, energy, and capabilities to the youth commission. And the truth is these two and a third kind of uh, musketeer really distinguished themselves by helping to drive the youth friendly business plan in a way that I thought was exceptionally mature, thoughtful, uh, deliberative and really solved a significant problem that came up during the issue and I was just really very very proud of them and whereas the town council feels that such outstanding public service deserves special recognition therefore the town council does hereby render with special appreciation commendation and thanks to each of you for the years of dedicated public service to the town of Los Gatos and its residents presented by the mayor and all of the council members and I'm pleased to have the mayor present these to each of you Could you, could you just shake hands and work through? Congratulations. Could you just shake hands and work your way through? And then I'll allow the consent items to be managed with the approval of the new youth commissioners. Thank you very much. And I should note that one of our consent, <coughs> excuse me, consent calendar items uh, will be the approval uh, of the new youth commissioners who will begin uh, their work uh, after in the new school year in September. Uh, and that uh, uh, Captain uh, D'Antonio uh, and the vice mayor and I uh, interviewed the stellar, stellar human beings and students uh, this past year, week and made the selection. Having said that, uh, to the town attorney for a closed session report. Thank you, council members of the public. The council met in closed session this evening as duly noticed on the agenda. They took no action and there's nothing to report out this evening. Thank you. Uh, council uh, and town manager reports. Uh, first of all, council matters. Uh, does any council member wish to report out on a council matter? Seeing no one, town manager. Madam Mayor, members of the council, a few items. We do have the council requested public meeting on the affordable housing overlay zones scheduled for tomorrow night, June 4th at 6.30 p.m. here in the council chambers, followed on Wednesday night, June 5th at 7 p.m. up at the Police Operations Building Community Room, the Solid Waste Advisory Committee community meeting that was requested by the Vice Mayor two council meetings ago. And then also immediately prior to your next meeting will be Music in the Park on Sunday, June 16th, the launch of this summer series uh, right in front. So that concludes staff report at this time. Thank you. Consent calendar. 
Uh, the consent calendar is a, a, a number of items which we approve with one motion, unless there is someone from the council or the, uh, and the audience that wishes to remove an item from the consent calendar. Going first to the council, does any council member wish to remove an item from the consent calendar? Seeing none, uh, does any member of the public wish to remove an item from the consent calendar? Seeing none, may I have a motion? Ms. Jensen. Move approval of the consent calendar consisting of items one through 10, I believe. Do I hear a second? Second. <laughs> a motion by Ms. Jensen, seconded by the vice mayor. Uh, discussion, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, passes unanimously. Now verbal communications. Uh, is there anybody from the audience wishing to address us Operative term on an item not on our agenda. Seeing no one coming forward, we will now go to the public hearing. This is agenda item 11, plan development application PD 12001, architecture and site application S 12078, and environmental impact report EIR 12003. The project location, 90-160 Albright Way and 14600 Winchester Boulevard. Property owner, LG Business Park, LLC. Applicant, John R. Schenck. Um, the, uh, does the town manager have anything that he would like to put on the record at this point? Yes, Madam Mayor, members of the council, staff gave the staff report at the last meeting, but there have been four documents submitted to the council and to the public since your last meeting. There was addendum number two, which included public comments circulated or dated May 30th. There was addendum number three, dated May 31st, which included both public comment as well as a report from the traffic consultant. And then today there were desk items C and D, both included additional public comment and responses to council questions. So there's been four documents circulated since uh, Thursday. Thank you. And uh, the staff will be available for questions after uh, we complete the public testimony. So now I will be calling uh, the names from those cards that were, this is a continued hearing, from those cards that were submitted uh, at the uh, first hearing uh, and where the names had not yet been called. Uh, the first name, uh, Jeff Longridge. Jeff Longridge. And uh, he will be followed by Joe Clark. My name is Jeff Lockridge. I live at uh, 109 Paseo Lower Court. So here's your test. Which of the following offers the best choice for Los Gatos? A, approve the Albright Office Park at its proposed 550,000 square foot size and ensure that Los Gatos schools get their fair share of the $1.4 million disregarding the town's general plan, as well as the associated traffic, eyesores, and blocking views that go along with it. Or B, deny the proposed development, requesting that our general plan guidelines are met at a size of 350,000 square feet, ensuring a maximum building height of 35 feet, and revenue for the schools of around $1 million. Or C, send the project back to the Planning Commission for the necessary compromises the proposed development needs to fit into our town while ensuring that the schools get their fair share of the tax revenues. The parents of Los Gatos school children were given the choice between just approving or denying, which is pretty much a black or white answer. $1.4 million for the schools or no money for the schools. Not very realistic, but the idea was to get as much support for the plan in as little time as possible. The real difference is around $370,000 between the two plans. So the question is, what is worth that difference in revenue? Is it worth it to build a full 30 feet over our general plan guidelines, which will surely block the views of our surrounding mountains, as well as losing the privacy of the surrounding neighbors? Or might a compromise be a better solution? The reduced height alternative from the draft EIR has already been shown to be the environmentally superior alternative. 
The potential numbers of employees for each plan will have a definite negative impact on the traffic on Winchester, Lark, and Los Gatos Boulevard. Just how much is yet to be determined since each of those roads have multiple new developments associated with them. Is it worth the risk of potential traffic gridlock? Both plans keep Netflix since they're only committing to 137,000 square feet. Is it really worth it to jeopardize our general plan? In the history of Los Gatos, both elected and non-elected officials have made similar difficult decisions. Those decisions resulted in some of the very reasons that my wife and I originally decided to move here, buy a house here, and raise our children here. I don't envy your position tonight. You have some difficult decisions to make. I hope you make the right choice for Los Gatos. Perhaps the best choice for Los Gatos is a compromise. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Clark followed by Douglas McNeil. Joe Clark. I don't see anybody coming forward with that name, so we go to Douglas McNeil followed by Joseph Gemis Gemisnani. Good evening, Doug McNeil, 17413 Pleasant View Avenue. I'm the proud parent of two children who have attended Las Gatas schools. From preschool to high school, we have volunteered in the classrooms, coached on the sports fields, developed award-winning science programs, helped build STEM science programs, recognized nationally, pledged our money to foundation fundraisers. We did this because that's what we do in Las Gatas. Other speakers have discussed that our schools are in need of additional funding due to state cuts. Just a factual reminder that several funding sources have recently made it into the schools, including the parcel tax this past May, a 4% retroactive raise for teachers, money was allocated from the Redevelopment Agency, approved developments of Las Gatos Boulevard will also generate money. Development of the North 40 will generate funds. The development will provide aggregate contribution. The purchase of the property has also generated a sum of money. But this hearing is not about the education system. We're hoping that a wishful corporate bailout from one developer and one project will change everything. From my perspective, we will not overcome all the issues of a troubled educational system with just the resources of one development. Every land use planning issues I've seen in this city and other cities have all started with four-story developments and somehow they all end up at two because that's what compromise is all about. The developer stated in a recent planning commission meeting that he was not willing to compromise at this time when several, when several viable alternatives have been proposed and not considered. It's time to ask the developer if he's here to team with the community and the council and not overstate promises. It's time to ask if he's ready to compromise or watch our quality of life and small town character be sold out to developers. If you do it for one, legally it sets a precedent. You need to start doing it for all and alter the recently adopted general plan. It's time to review and think about the objective evidence that there is an opportunity to achieve benefit for us all. It's fair to say not the time to allow one developer to have free reign to subjugate and sidestep the general plan. I urge you to, in the most respectful way, to send this back to the Planning Commission who recommended against the proposal and let our panel of experts serve the best interests of this amazing town where we seek a compromise and solution that serves us all. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph Gamasnani, and then looks like Eric Eastland. Yeah, uh, Joseph Gimignani in National Avenue, Los uh, Gatos. Um, well, the first guy kind of stole my thunder because I was going to say, first of all, I kind of feel for your guy's task because I didn't hear much compromise that previous night. Um, and to me, a compromise is when both sides leave, leave the um, room tonight not getting what they want. If everybody gets what they want, it's not a compromise. Um, you know, I feel for the people in the Charter Oaks neighborhood, even though I don't live there, because this would be a massive development, I think, for them. But they're stuck on this, you know, 35 and 350. I say, um, I think it's a very prominent location. I dismiss some of the comments that, oh, it's tucked away near a freeway. First of all, there's thousands of cars that go by on Highway 85, thousands that go by Highway 17. 
a lot of cars go on Winchester Boulevard. We want this to be a nice project, and I, and I, I want it to be a project that represents Los Gatos. Um, and so what I like, I guess my point is, I wish you guys would just work with planning and don't drag this out for the sake of the developers and everybody else involved, but work with them maybe a couple months, see if we can come back with a plan that maybe scales it back to say 450,000 feet. I mean, not have to be to 350, but 450, at least it's a compromise. Um, you know, and I also looked at their, like at the San Jose Business Journal, and they kept showing these architectural renderings of the project in, the, in a style I thought was more like Los Gatos, so it was kind of a Mediterranean, it looked almost like the Netflix building, and then all of a sudden they changed it to this modern four-story boxy building. I'm not sure why that took place, other than, than perhaps trying to lower the height by chopping off the roofscape. But anyway, could you please go talk to planning? Maybe if they did a you know smaller scale with maybe traditional architecture, it'll fit in better with Los Gatos. Um, I'm, I'm kind of from Chicago, actually, and this current building reminds me of the suburbs of Chicago. It doesn't really speak to me of Los Gatos. Um, and lastly, I went to see a movie at AMC Mercado in Santa Clara, and um, you know, I saw a lot of new buildings there. They weren't five stories and six stories, as they claimed. There was two-story buildings, three-story buildings, four- and five-story buildings. So these were brand-new buildings. So, so you can't tell me that you have to have a four- or five-story building and also along that logic line, let's say in 10 years, eight stories the norm in Santa Clara and San Jose. So are people gonna come here and propose seven and eight story buildings, because that's the norm? So I mean, let's skip the modern trends and do what's good for Los Gatos. And I think traditional architecture, maybe a compromise, scaling it back a little bit. Let's just work one or two months with, with planning so we don't drag this on forever. And that's, that's about all I can say. I'm sorry that that other guy was about the only other one that's willing to compromise, because you have a, it seems like not many people here want to compromise. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> it looks like Eric Eastland and Terry, uh, let me try this, McBriarty. Hi, Eric Eastland, 201 Charter Oak Circle. My biggest concern regarding the proposed Albright project is the exceptions we're giving the developer for the height and density of the buildings. The project that's pr proposed would be inconsistent with the zoning regulations, with the land use policies, and with the community design policies of the general plan. The point of zon the zoning and, and policies of the general plan is, is to prevent the exact effects that the proposed Albright project would create, such as traffic con congestion leading to the inability to come in and out of neighborhoods off of Lark Avenue and other safety issues, visual impacts of the proposed buildings, including dissonance with the surrounding area, noise pollution, noise and pollution to the adjacent neighborhood, and loss of our existing small town character. Allowing these exceptions and disregarding the guidelines of the general plan will set a precedent for future town developments. The Albright developer compares his proposed development with the Netflix Aventino development, which was given exceptions to the height and density limitations. With the North 40 next, when will these, when will these exceptions stop? For the sake of all Los Gatos communities, the time to stop them is now. There is a much better plan for the town to adopt. This plan is the environmentally superior option listed as an alternative to the Albright development in the EIR. This option consists of two three-story and two two-story buildings with a total of 350,000 square feet. This is not only consistent with the general plan's guidelines, but also out of the 11 objectives for the development, this plan fulfills the five that revolve around protecting the environment and the development's sustainability. The developer, Mr. Shank, has discredited, discredited this option as financially unfeasible, citing a return on investment of 6.3% on the 350 square foot as opposed to 7.1% on the 550 square foot development. But recent findings submitted to the council by CPA Greg Snow has used Netflix 10 year lease at $46.11 per square foot per year, bring back to Shank a more than feasible return on, on investment for a 350 square foot option that even matches Shank's estimate return on investment for the 550 square foot proposal. In addition, the schools would get around $900,000 in tax revenue. This option is a no-brainer. The plan is environmentally superior, has a minimal impact on surrounding neighborhoods and traffic, is consistent with the general plan, provides significant revenue to schools, and gets Shank his return on investment. The choice is easy. Send this project back to the Planning Commission. There is a better way. Thank you. Thank you. 
Terry McBriarty, followed by Bruce Harrison. Hi, <coughs> sorry. Hi, Terry McBriarty, Garden Hill Drive. Um, I found it very frustrating to come here um, the previous night. We were all here listening to so many people speak out in support of Albright Way, who um, very few of whom, if any, seemed like they would be directly impacted by the development. Um, everyone was listing addresses that were, uh, you know, downtown, far from the development. Um, I didn't hear anyone who was going to be directly impacted by the development speaking out in favor of it. And they, the attitude basically seemed to be um, the people who live in Charter Oaks sort of need to suck it up, you know, tough for you. You bought next to this, you know, retail space and now somebody bought it who isn't going to play by the rules. So it's better for the rest of the town. So if your property's not going to be worth so much anymore, well, that sucks for you. You know, if, you know, somebody bought a bunch of land next to you and, you know, Blossom Manor, and now your $3 million house was going to be worth a million bucks, um, I'll bet you'd be out hiring your lawyer and whining a lot, whereas everybody else here is with their approve Albright signs. You know, I don't think anyone wants Netflix to leave. I don't want Netflix to leave, but this isn't about Netflix leaving. This is about a huge property being developed in our town that is going to be around for a lot longer than Netflix. You know, these buildings that were built there weren't, you know, where the companies that they were built for long gone. You know, this building is going to be around for a long time and a lot of thought needs to be put into these buildings. And they could be built many different ways to accommodate the people at Charter Oaks and possibly below the 550,000 square feet. I'm very concerned about the traffic impact on Lark. You know, if the North 40 is developed, the AHZ goes in there, and this development, Lark is going to be completely overcrowded with traffic. It already is not safe the way it is. You know, there was a traffic death there in February 2010. If my husband had been sitting at that intersection waiting for the light to turn green to go to work, I'd be standing here a widow. You know, with more car trips going by that street every day, the likelihood of another accident like that happening is, is more likely. You know, that puts me and my family at risk. And, but tough luck for me, I bought my house in the wrong place. Too bad. You know, is, is that the kind of town we live in? Is money more important than people's lives? Because it's going to be dangerous. Lark Avenue is going to be dangerous, and nothing can be done to mitigate that. You can't put in another traffic light to make things safer. Thank you. Bruce Harrison, followed by Joe Grummet. Good evening, council members. I'm Bruce Harrison. I live at 179 La Montagna Court. Uh, La Montagna Court is a neighborhood of single family homes located extraordinarily close to the proposed development um, near the intersection of, of Winchester and Wimbledon. Um, I work at Stanford Hospital and Clinics as a vice president there and moved here three years ago with my family and, and children. Uh, after looking at, at Palo Alto as a place to live, um, I fell in love with Los Gatos because of the community feel. When we bought our home, I was aware of the regulations in terms of building sizes and construction and specifically chose to live where we did um, because I love the neighborhood, I love the sense of community. Um, I commute 45 to 60 minutes daily to come back to Los Gatos because I love it here. Uh, and I didn't want to live in Palo Alto with, with larger buildings and, and greater congestion. In the morning when I leave my home, I sit at the on-ramp at Winchester to 85 for about 15 minutes just to get onto the freeway. Um, I then sit on 85 for another 15 to 20 minutes just to get to 280 because it's bumper to bumper the entire way. My return trip home is exactly the same. If we add additional traffic and congestion and cars getting on and off of 85, uh, it is going to become unbearable for us. Uh, so from a perspective of the quality of life, uh, the traffic, 
and the associated uh, hazards that could be caused by having these large buildings there, I would highly urge you to consider a, a compromise with the developer uh, and propose something smaller, such as the uh, the 3350, which I think would be an option that would keep Netflix here in our community. I would very much like to see Netflix stay, um, and I believe that the tax revenue would be very beneficial to us here in Los Gatos, but this is about a large real estate project. It's not solely about Netflix. Netflix can be accommodated in a 3350, uh, and we as a, a community can continue to maintain the quality of life that we've become accustomed to. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Joe Grummet, followed by Phil Abenez. Good evening. My name is Joe Crummett. I'm a Los Gatos resident. I live on Edelin Avenue downtown. Um, I'm also a DEVCON construction employee, a company that builds projects similar to this throughout the area very successfully. And as a, as a resident of Los Gatos, I, I love the small town feel here, embrace it. That's why I live here. Um, and I feel that this, this project brings some good jobs close to home, which is, which is a very important thing as well. Um, one of the things that I'd like to remind is that council does have the authority to approve this project tonight and that this project was recommended for approval by the staff. Um, another, another thing is that uh, this project, although it has traffic and other, other impacts, is, is something that's going to create a huge benefit to the local schools and the community. Um, I think that's very important here in Los Gatos as a resident, somebody who will have children in the school system someday, which you know, currently, obviously looking, looking for some funding support there that this project offers. Um, again, thank you for your support, um, and I hope to hear your approval of this project. Thank you. Phil Abanez, and then Dave Brown. Good, e good evening. Uh, my name is Phil Albanez. I'm a Los Gatos resident, and my wife is a local Los Gatos business owner. I'm standing here tonight in support for the proposed Albright campus. Uh, I'd like to begin, I'd like to commend the town council. You are placed in these positions to make difficult decisions uh, for the greater good of Los Gatos. You have distinctly been given the authority in the town's general plan to approve this development as presented and will hopefully do so tonight. I am 27 years old. I highlight my age because it is important to recognize the fact that I believe my age group has been underrepresented throughout this process, even though my age group the future Las Gatas residents may very well be the most, most, have the most at stake here tonight. I'm a young professional who is planning to live in Las Gatas for the rest of my life. The town attracts my wife and me for all the reasons that have been mentioned. Community, location, restaurants, vibrant downtown, and much more. Las Gatas is an ideal town to reside in. My argument begins with, and is the foundation is, the developments and progress such as this Albright campus are a necessary component for Los Gatos to stay as the Los Gatos we all know and love for future generations. This type of progress goes hand in hand with the continuation of this beautiful place that you have all built. The consistent argument against the development follows the logic that having buildings over 35 feet in height will affect the small town sense. It somehow relates physical buildings to the concept of community. What, where, where this logic is flawed is that it doesn't properly address what makes up community. The main factor behind the community and small town feel is the people not buildings. Where buildings and development enter this discussion is that they are necessary to attract the right kind of people that will in turn build your community. Quality of life is paramount for my generation. <clears throat> Excuse me. One major factor that we attribute to a high quality of life is our commute. <laughs> Remember, we expect to have everything at our fingertips. Uh, my generation will live where they work. Uh, it is for this reason why Netflix wants to be in Los Gatos. It offers employees an ideal location to live and work which is an element that Netflix will then leverage in recruiting the world's top talent, and it is this same talent that will be a big part of the future community of Las Gatos. Buildings, particularly building heights, do not negatively impact the small town sense. Communities exist because of the people. Progress such as a, progress, such as a proposed Albright campus will only guarantee that the small town community feel that Las Gatos is known for will continue, will continue for generations to come. Please stand with me, along with the majority of your community members, and approve the Albright campus tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dave Bone, and then Sandy Decker.
Dave Bone, B-O-H-N. All right, record will note no one came forward. So we'll have Sandy Deckard followed by Bob Shepard. Good evening, Council. I'm Sandy Decker. Um, I was excited about this young fellow saying he's coming and, um, and he's an Albanese. He's part of the history of this community. We're all part of the history of this community, Council. And this is, this is the community that offers everything. We are the only, the only extensive historic downtown. We are the town of choice. We cannot expand our streets. We have historic buildings on both sides. We cannot bring 3,000 cars a day into this town and then let them leave in the afternoon on our, on our poorly, actually they're not poor streets, they're good. We just can't maintain that kind of collapsed traffic. The majority of our ingress and egress in this town is two lane. We did that on purpose because of the small town character of this town. We were set up to be a town where people come home. This application council is our tipping point. When this application is built out at the higher level with all the other overly dense development along Los Gatos Boulevard, our land use will basically no longer be sustainable. If this is approved as, a pro as proposed, you will see every developer and every commercial realtor in the audience using the 65 foot height limit, these traffic counts, and the approximately 600 square feet monolithic design as precedence for their next project in Los Gatos. Council, as you know, we have allowed the ubiquitous PD to corrupt our general plan and even allowed that PD to be overridden, to override our zoning ordinances using specious findings and exceptions. Only you, Council, can reverse this destructive trend and return this application to the Planning Commission to work within the parameters of the general plan, sending a message to the development community that you are going to protect the unique and very vulnerable fabric of Los Gatos that is its unique beauty, its small town sense of place that the vision statement of the general plan calls our home. Don't be the council that turned us into a corporate revenue driven and dependent town that sold its character. Thank you. Thank you, Bob Shepard and then Pierluigi Olivero. My name is Bob Shepard and before I give you my input, I'd like to thank you, the city council members for your time and energy and effort that you put in and the time you've spent with us much appreciated. And I'm in complete support of this project and this project moving forward now. The project will bring additional vibrancy and additional jobs into Las Gatos. And I've read the reports and the project is consistent with the town's general plan and it meets your goals. You, the city council, have the legal authority to approve this project using a planned development overlay. The EAR is compre uh, comprehensive, it's also complete. The City Council should use that professional data to make its decision. This project creates jobs short term, it also creates jobs long term. And jobs don't just sig signify a place to come to work, but also the financial benefits to this community. Now in previous generations, it used to be that jobs were an activity. It'd be an activity that people go to work, but now jobs are a lifestyle. And that's what people are looking to, is a lifestyle. People want to have that lifestyle here in Los Gatos. So we have old tired buildings, or we move to a nice new campus. This project is for the next generation. And I heard a lot of support at the last meeting where they talked about schools and, and the benefit to schools. One mother even spoke about she just had a fundraiser for raising enough money for pencils and paper. Losing Netflix 
as the largest revenue generator in Los Gatos is a horrible mistake. If Netflix moves, they have 160,000 feet on Winchester Boulevard. They have another 40,000 feet on Knowles. There's over 40 million square feet in Silicon Valley. Companies are begging to have Netflix come to their town. Netflix and companies like Netflix want to be in Los Gatos. This project has been evaluated and studied for over three years. It's time to move this project forward now. Thank you. Thank you. Pierre Luigi Olivero. Noting for the record, no one's coming forward. Tricia Capri. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. My name is Tricia Capri. I live on Los Gatos Boulevard. I've been here since January of 89, very active in the community and feel very strongly about the support of this project. Um, let's just get net net on this. We're either going to have this new building with 550,000 square feet for growing hot companies like Netflix, Barracuda, Roku, or we're going to have the same old thing and maybe they'll clean it up a little. I don't really see a middle ground with everyone that I've been talking to. Why would a developer spend over $100 million to get 100,000 more square feet? It just doesn't really add up and doesn't make sense. So while it sounds fabulous to just tell them they should cut it and, and be as is, they have business needs and they know what their needs are. It sounds to me like there have been some compromises already. So if the best they can do is class B or C tenants, why wouldn't they just bring it up to class B and call it a day or maybe sell it and move on? The answer is the developers already told us they would not build the compromised new project because it wouldn't be financeable and doesn't make good economic sense. So what's that mean to us? No property tax increase, no additional money for our schools, no sustainable environmental implementations, no Netflix, no job growth. No ripple economic effect to our community. I, I, I for one, don't live, work in town. I, I would love to have a job when, <laughs> down the street. I know many would. Do you remember the backlash over the new Safeway? I do, because I lived two blocks away, and I listened to the not in my backyard. We didn't want construction. We didn't want to be bothered. It just delayed it. But it's beautiful. Have you been in Safeway? I've seen probably many of you in there. It's a nice place. It's good for us. So, you know, I know people are change-averse and risk-averse, and it's scary for people, and I can appreciate that. I'm, I'm fortunate that I feel like it's so great to live in Silicon Valley with so many people that embrace change. The reason we have this dynamic little fancy little town we all live in is because people do take the chance. They, they, they make Silicon Valley what it is, and many of those people live here. So I'd say that the compromise being asked for by the opposition is probably too close to what they have today, and I think we're not realistic if we think that they're just going to do it. It's the right time for this project. It's the right location. It's not downtown. This doesn't change the character of downtown. It's the right project. It's a home run. And it is consistent with the general plan. And they're willing to invest in our community and offer more, lo more local jobs. The council has the authority to approve the project. It is your legal rights. So I ask you to please approve this project as it's presented tonight. And I'd like to also draw your attention to go home and Google the most recent Mercury News editorial that talks about how it's underdeveloped, as many would have done it. And um, we don't want to be a business hostile community. I love this little town. And, and those of you that know me know I do. And I just think it's really the right thing, the right time, and the right place. Thank you so much, and I urge you to support it. Thank you. That's the last card. Uh, One more thing. Could I ask those of you in favor to please stand? Whoa. All right. All right, let's quiet down. All right, that's the uh, last speaker. So now we will go to the applicant. The applicant will have five minutes, as I noted uh, before. Uh, I understand the applicant may have a team. So uh, you have five minutes for anyone who's speaking on your behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Spector. And uh, we, we do have a team here, and, and they'll be available for questions and such that may come up later. But in this precious time I have, I do want to emphasize a few points. And they are uh, a few that you've heard this evening. But one, that the project clearly complies with the general plan, that the town's PD overlay zoning is the appropriate zoning designation in this unique circumstance, that you have all the tools you need to approve the project, 
the vast majority of town residents support the project for all the right reasons. They understand the project, they've analyzed the facts. They also understand that change is difficult. This is a, uh, a lot of people talk about compromise, and it is a compromise plan on many fronts. And while uh, I'm happy to discuss ways to modify and, and do things with the project, but we're, I'm not uh, here to compromise on what the objective of the project is. According to the general plan, preserving the small town character of Los Gatos involves attention to a lot of things, and it's a collection of related issues that include human scale development, historic preservation, density and intensity, population growth, downtown preservation, development in the Highway 85 North 40 area, congestion, open space, views of the hills, the type of businesses that are located in town, protection of the town's various neighborhoods and community design, a lot, a lot of values and a lot, a lot of goals that need to be put into a balance and weighed. And we believe that we've done that very well on this project and specifically on a few of those in terms of things that are, are, are eye-catching to some. Human scale development. Our project's divided into four buildings and carefully cited um, that as opposed to what's allowed or encouraged by the town under the existing zoning, which would be shorter, more uh, spread out buildings covering uh, double the land that we're covering under our proposed plan. In terms of density and intensity, the increase in, in the, to, to help the jobs housing balance in town and to attract uh, business, the town needs space and the project adds the space to a site that's already a, a commercial space. It's been identified since the town's original general plan in 1963 to be a job center. And we put it there as opposed to attracting jobs into new locations or, or, or land that hasn't been developed. And it, our site is also unique in that it has, it's virtually wrapped in existing mature trees. Um, and again, our site plan allows the buildings to uh, have substantially greater setbacks than are um, allowed or encouraged under the current zoning. The density of the project is 30% less dense than the Netflix Aventino project, and I think that's important, an important data point as people get a sense of feeling about what the project will be like. And, it is, and the reason it's 30% less is because it is a transition. It's a transition from Highway 85, the railroad tracks, Winchester Boulevard, and those uses, as a, and, and with the setbacks and the existing trees, creates a great buffer to the residential community that is within the commercial zone. On the views of the hills, based on, as you've seen in the, the reports and in the EIR, on the accurate and peer-reviewed um, photo simulations, we have shown that there, we're not impacting any critical view sheds or anything else. It is true, the buildings are not invisible, they can be seen depending on where one stands or where one looks, they block a view of something, just as every single structure and tree does, in town and outside of town. In terms of the types of businesses located in town, one of the fundamental premises of the project is to attract Class A tenants, to retain, hopefully, and attract tenants. Over the many years and decades, the project would exist. That helps to diversify the town and make it more of a full-service community. In terms of protection of existing neighborhoods, we think, as, as you've seen in the site plans and the photo sims, we've taken great care to set ourselves back, to create a blank, solid wall in the parking structure so that lights, noises, and everything are protected the respect for the existing environment there. There's been a lot of work that have gone into the exact siting of buildings, their, their elevation and the uh, uh, fitting them in with it within the network of the existing trees has been very carefully done. In conclusion, the project will bring great jobs and businesses that enhance the quality of life in town. Clearly, lots of uh, neat financial uh, benefits through redevelopment of older sites that, that work as a function of the way the property tax laws work. We ask that you discern fact from fiction when it comes to these things. A lot of presented simulations and such are just not accurate, not ill-intended, I'm sure, but inaccurate. So we ask that you, do, you look at that and you rely on the facts and request your approval of the EIR, the zoning in the ANS this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none, the public testimony is now closed. Uh, and um, a couple of housekeeping chores. First of all, uh, I will ask council for any disclosures for the period of time uh, from the last meeting uh, until now, uh, starting with Mr. Brzezinski. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, in the last two weeks, I have continued to read all the emails on 
both sides and encountered folks on both sides who were interested in expressing their opinions. In addition, I have met with the developer at their request again, and I do want to make one thing clear. There was a question raised by a member of our, uh, of our community about my relationship as the chair of the Valley Transportation Board of Directors this year and my ability to sit and uh, deliberate on this particular issue. And for your information, um, there is no conflict. Um, my chairmanship is based on my representative of the, of the five West Valley cities at the appointment of the mayors of those cities. And um, there is uh, an issue that I think needs to be clarified, and that is that, that um, there is a Vasona light rail element in our general plan that encourages and, and promotes the, the completion of the 1.6 mile uh, segment to the Vasona station from the Winchester station. Um, I am fully prepared, uh, having read the documentation th thoroughly, um, to be able to appropriately vote on this issue and at the same time assure everyone that the size of this building, the approval of this building has um, will have no effect on whether the Vasona light rail line is completed because of the fact there are so many competing interests, um, for example, the, the East Ridge line that's currently in process of being approved. Uh, the only issue that arose recently was the fact that VTA had to weigh in on the EIR. VTA weighs in on every EIR and it's either an up or down and so that, that was standard protocol for the, for the VTA has nothing to do with my ability to vote uh, on this particular project. So I want to make that clear, as uh, uh, Councilwoman Jensen did at our last meeting about her, her the issue that was raised in her regard as well. Um, there is no concern uh, of, uh, of being objective in this, in this particular session, and uh, I am looking forward to the opportunity to make that, that decision. Thank you. Uh, disclosures for the last two weeks, Ms. Jensen. I've also read the hundreds of emails that have come since la our last meeting on this project, uh, including many, many, many today. Uh, I have also met with David Wells from Netflix. I have met with Lee Quintana, and I met with Sandy Decker primarily on another issue, but the Albright issue did come up. Thank you. Um, in the last two weeks, uh, I have met with Mr. Wells. Uh, and I neglected to disclose last time uh, that one of my meetings was um, with uh, Diane Anderson of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, other than that, it's um, people in the street and lots of paper. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. In the last two weeks, I also met with Mr. Wells from Netflix, as well as read hundreds of emails up until this afternoon. And that's all for me. Ms. McNutt. Um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, in the last two weeks, I have not met any more with the developer. I've not met with any of the lobbying groups. I have read everything and casual conversations one-on-one -on -one with residents with a wide variety of opinions. Thank you all. Uh, I'm now going to go to the uh, manager uh, and uh, give the council the opportunity to ask questions. Since my mic is on, I'm going to start with me. Um, the uh, one, I have two traffic-related questions. Uh, one has to do with a left-hand turn from uh, Lark, let's see, I got, no, Winchester going uh, south onto Lark going east. Uh, right now there are two uh, left turn lanes uh, and um, based upon the draft EIR and my own personal experience, uh, they uh, back up. Uh, and what, if anything, is going to be done in this project as it relates to those turning lanes? Um, Madam Mayor, before answering the question, I did just want to let the council know we have array, an array of staff resources available from obviously the town attorney and myself and our consulting attorney, Jim Moose, Joel Paulson, the lead planner, Kevin Rahani behind me to my right, uh, will answer the traffic questions and we have other staff and consultants who've worked on parts of the environmental documentation, the traffic analysis, and otherwise. And I mention all that just as we pass the mic around to respond to your questions. Uh, please bear with us during that period. First up will be Mr. Rahani on the traffic and transportation questions. Uh, Mayor Spector, members of the council, 
Um, regarding the, your question on the left turn from Winchester into Lark Avenue, the project itself, we are working on multiple projects at this time in that area. One of the projects we're working on is actually on design of the improvements to Lark and Winchester intersection. That improvement involves in, uh, an addition of a what we call a receiving lane, which is a northbound lane on Lark on Winchester Boulevard, that would receive the traffic from Winchester from Lark, going northbound on Winchester. As a part of that, when we reconfigure that uh, traffic signal, that would expedite the flow of traffic that comes from southbound Winchester, going eastbound on Lark, coming through Lark through our new uh, signal. That would help facilitate. Uh, uh, that left turn, uh, left turn movements that you alluded to, uh, because of the location of Lark and uh, Wimbledon along Winchester, those are back-to-back -back, uh, left turn movements. So there are some physical impediments that doesn't allow for extension of the left turn, but with the approach that we have, we can facilitate and make that intersection run more efficiently. Thank you. If I understand you correctly, uh, you're not going to be able to extend the left-hand turn lanes, but by uh, putting in the right-hand turn lane onto yes. uh, Winchester North and doing something with the signals, uh, you think that will improve it? Uh, correct. When will these improvements be made, and what is the participation of this applicant in those improvements? Uh, this, uh, that project is under design as we speak. We plan to, for the construction of that project to begin in the fall of this year. Uh, this applicant, if approved, would be contributing towards a number of uh, off-site improvements, including that intersection, uh, Winchester Knowles intersection. So there's a number of uh, off-site uh, uh, traffic improvements that they will be paying towards their share of it. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then the other question I have. Error? I'm if, sorry, yes. If I might add, and I just wanted to remind uh, the town engineer uh, as reported to council in the desk item of performance standard 107F that requires the applicant as part of the project in phase one to do the restriping of the left turn lanes on southbound Winchester to eastbound Lark. And that is an explicit requirement. Uh, condition 107F if does, the council pr approves the project. Does restriping mean anything other than like repainting it? <laughs> Extending the lane. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry, I wasn't clear in my answer. It would extend the lane uh, up A to slight Wimbledon, slightly. To Wimbledon. There would be slight modification to that. All right, thank you. Uh, and I am going to ask everyone. Uh, this council and this staff has given you uh, a lot of. Uh, uh, we have been very polite to you for a long time, so I will expect that back in return. Thank you. Uh, another question about Charter Oaks. Um, there's been questions with regard to Charter Oaks in the morning uh, going east on Lark uh, and then uh, in the evening uh, going north, uh, I see that, that would be west on Lark and turning into Charter Oaks. Uh, and I know from all of my discussions with the applicant, uh, with staff, uh, that that is a, uh, a challenging issue. Uh, and so my question is, uh, is it possible to put on Lark uh, a, uh, I don't even know what it's called, a, a blocking where, you know, do not, uh, not block this area? Um, yes, uh, what you alluded to, Madam Mayor, is a keep clear zone. We have it on different sections of the town at the various intersection. Yes, uh, the short answer to your question, yes, it is possible. And uh, the project that I mentioned uh, before, uh, improvements at Lark and Winchester would actually facilitate the flow of traffic on Lark Avenue. But to install a keep clear zone at Charter Oaks to uh, help uh, clear that area in case there is any backup that is possible, we could do that. And would we do this as a condition of this application, or is this something that uh, needs to circle back? Uh, how do we keep this in the process? This could be uh, definitely as a part of the uh, various improvement projects we plan to do at Lark and Winchester. Could be uh, that we would do that anyhow as a part of several. We have several projects in that area. We could include that as one of those projects. Madam Mayor, to clarify, you could add it as a condition to the project. But right now it wouldn't be, and so it would be something we'd have to remember to do. And 
as I do for all meetings, I'm keeping a log of issues the council raises. Okay, thank you very much. I have no further questions and so does anyone else. Ms. Jensen. Uh, Mr. Rohani, I have a related question regarding traffic impacts. In the EIR, uh, there are five impacted intersections uh, identified as being significantly impacted by the project as proposed. And the mitigation measure that's identified is essentially contributing into a general traffic fund. And I think that if the project is approved as proposed, it's something on the order of $190,000. So I'm curious to complete the improvements that are required to mitigate the impacts to less than significant levels how much money is needed for each of those intersections and can it be done with $190,000? Certainly. Um, the 190000 that you alluded to, that is a <coughs> any, any development projects in town, they're what we call the traffic mitigation impact. And there's a formula depending on the size and uh, magnitude of the project we calculate and any development would have to pay towards that. For this project, in its current form, if, in, if approved, that's how much they would be paying towards the project. Now, that uh, I mentioned earlier, in addition to the 190000 that, if approved, they would pay, the developer ha has agreed to pay almost five, over $500,000 towards other improvements. And those are their, uh, what we refer to, kind of the share of various mitigations at other intersections. Uh, that are impacted, uh, such as uh, Winchester Lark, Winchester Knowles, and others in that area. So they would be fully paying their share of any traffic improvements as related to their projects. It's on, on a different topic, and I don't know who would answer it. Um, this is regarding the light and glare that's going to be emitted from the proposed project, and it is identified in various places in our uh, document. It indicates, our EIR document indicates that there's no significant impact from light and glare and that is because the staff has reviewed photo simulations and decided there isn't any. And where are those? Which staff evaluated them and what's the evaluation? Thank you. Um, the, it's actually a photometric study which specifically looks at light um, and that was done by the applicant and staff, myself, as well as Parks and Public Works staff have reviewed that as they do for any other project of this nature. I will get you the exact sheet of what shows the photometric study here shortly. I've just got to dig through this and, and find that. Uh, while you're doing that, th let me follow up on that. Is, is the photometric study a study of lighting which is placed on the uh, property or is it lighting that comes from the buildings or both it is lighting that is on the site and typically that is direct lighting which it is the significant effect on adjacent properties the internal glow from the lights you don't generally see the direct light source so that does not have um, as significant of an impact to adjacent neighbors will someone looking from far away see some light glow Sure, if they're looking that way, they would, but that is not considered a significant impact. Mr. Brzezinski. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is a traffic I a question, I guess, for Mr. Rohani. Mr. Rohani, um, we have an um, attachment 21 document dated May 30 uh, from TJKM Transportation Consultants, and it, uh, it talks about a number of the issues that have been raised various times by, uh, in our, our public testimony. Um, evaluating the impacts of number of trips um, and a couple things I'd like you to clarify for us. Uh, in, um, in the fourth paragraph, it talks about the, the issues related to the actual trip rates of buildings and complexes um, in, in the type of uh, proposed development that we have in front of us and um, how the patterns of commuting take place within the professional um, professional milieu of this this type of operation. I wonder if you could um, enhance that for me, if you would, and it relates to peak hour rates and so forth. The second question, since you know, we might as well move to um, both of them. You can answer both. 
There's also a, a conversation about the, um, the generation of trips per s thousand square feet of uh, Morning Peak and so forth. And the, um, the issue raised by the uh, TJKM folks is that actually their numbers are more conservative because they're, they're based on more um, holistic evaluations uh, rather than specific to the type of businesses that might be encountered in this, in this facility. Would you explain both of those for me, please? Certainly, uh, Council Member Przezinski. Um, and uh, Mayor Spector, if I may, on this traffic uh, component and issue, obviously there's lots been said, and um, we're respectful of opinion on, on both sides. If I can, I'd like to take a few minutes to just provide you some background, go over some of the facts and criteria that we've used throughout this project from preparing the traffic report to its study and analysis, and I think that will uh, provide you perspective and really focus on the facts and guidelines because uh, I think that would help in your uh, deliberation tonight, if I may. Um, you know, this project, uh, it's been almost three years that uh, we've been working on this project, has gone through a very extensive uh, study, analysis, review, both internal to the town staff and also to our uh, TJKM, Council Member Przezinski mentioned, they are our peer review traffic consultant. We've studied over 29 intersections. Uh, out of those 29, 19 of them are in Los Gatos, seven are in Campbell, three of them in San Jose. In addition to all of those intersections, we also performed operational analysis on Winchester, Overlock, volumes of report, volumes of analysis has been done. And on this, not only we looked at this project specifically, but as we do with all of our development projects, we look at the cumulative effect, that is, all of the other projects that are in pipeline, because in our uh, development process and on the traffic engineering, we're very conservative in Las Gatos, how we approach this thing to make sure we're looking at <coughs> scenarios that would uh, theoretically generate the most traffic. Regarding the uh, trip, trip generation uh, issue that was mentioned, uh, for this project, as it is with every project, we use the Institute of Transportation Engineers ITE Trip Generation Manual. This manual is the <coughs> most accurate and reliable source for determining and forecasting traffic volumes and trips throughout the country is essentially industry standard through every state, uh, county, and the city in Silicon Valley. Every, every city, VTA, Santa Clara County, uses these uh, trip generations. <coughs> and in our approach, uh, for instance, for, for projects of this sort, there are hundreds of different categories that trip generations are determined. For this project, we use the office complex, or office park, excuse me. Office park in, in the trip generation uh, ward generates the most traffic. Theoretically, we could have used uh, R&D center or corporate headquarters. Each of those would have a lower uh, trip generations. We use the office park just to be overly conservative in our analysis of all of the uh, traffic reports. Now, there's been some anecdotal um, discussion um, <coughs> brought up that the, the new companies, the modern companies, use a different model. The, tr the trip rates are different than what the ITE is. How ITE, the Institute of Transportation Engineers, which, which by the way, 40% of all of their uh, the uh, calculations is based on the state of California. This is a nationwide uh, institution. These volumes are done nationwide, but 40% of them are in California. They are done, they're derived from actual counts that are done by traffic engineers over hundreds of different office parks throughout the country, California included, counting cars coming in and leaving these sites. It is not something subjective, it is not just a number that they pull out of air. And because it is, it is such a diverse, it accounts for var variances. At this office park, you have different uh, business models, different employee patterns, different uh, uh, features and facilities, working hours. It averages out to, to take out the peaks and valleys. <coughs> uh, in your packet, there was a letter that uh, 
was from TJKM, and they couldn't be here tonight. Uh, they were here uh, last Monday. They work for a number of municipalities in this valley, and a lot of them uh, work on uh, uh, private companies who actually do development uh, throughout. For this project, just as a matter of perspective, <coughs> Some of the most recent development project that has been done in this valley, they're using a ratio of 1.16 and 1.3 for per thousand square foot. For this project, we use the 1.6 trips per thousand square foot, which is over 20% of any of those other similarly high-tech companies in the valley. Again, our focus has always been we wanted to look at the very, uh, very conservative approach on the traffic uh, forecasting on this project to make sure that we're looking at, at the scenario that uh, utilizes or creates theoretically uh, most volume of traffic. Thank you. Other questions for Mr. Rouhani? Mr. McNutt. Mr. Rouhani or any staff. Ms. McNutt. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I want to um, ask a question about precedent that keeps coming up as, as an issue. Um, and along with uh, the whole ID, idea of the PD zoning. So in our staff, I mean, not staff report today, the, uh, one of the desk items, um, we found out that there are about 75 PDs in Las Gatos right now. They go back as far as 40 years. Um, and staff estimate is that about three quarters of those have different regulations in those PD zones than the underlying zone. So how do we how do we put that information together with this idea of of precedent? And can you give me some examples of some of the deviations? So I'd, I'd back. I don't know I'm sorry. I don't know who I'm looking at. <laughs> sorry, to the mayor. Um, so I'd back up and and say that, that as you stated, there are a number of plan developments. The general plan has specifically set up a mechanism for the deciding body, which is the town council for ordinances, to approve projects that may vary from the typical standards either in the general plan or the zoning code. Um, those generally. Uh, over the past 13, almost 13 years I've been here, our lot size, setbacks, parking, um, few for height, um, those are the generally the, the biggest ones. FAR coverage, small lot residential, small lot single family that you've seen a number of planned developments on don't meet the underlying zoning requirements for those. So those are the typical requirements. But the general plan has a mechanism to allow the deciding body to approve those, and that is through a specific, or through a special planning area, in this case, a, case, a plan development overlay zone. And so that allows the council the authority to approve or deny any applications that come forward under a PD zone um, as a matter of course. The issue, I think there was one more question that you had, and I'm trying well, to... Well, it's, it's this idea of precedent. So that, okay. do each of those 75 PDs that we have, or the three, if I do the math, three quarters of 75 is over 50, um, do each of the uh, different regulations in those PD zones uh, become precedent? Should we be looking at those as precedent for looking at this PD application? Is this... Or, or is or not all PDs are looked at on an individual basis um, they don't set precedent they don't all have the exact same exceptions that that each one has these go back to I believe the 70s um, when this was first done so I know everyone always thinks every project that comes through whether it's planning commission or council sets a precedent but ultimately the deciding body has the ability to make an independent judgment on each application and if I may, just to follow up on that, this is a discussion that um, council and the community has on a regular basis. Um, and as we've indicated before on projects, each project is evaluated on its own merit. And especially when you've got a planned development um, before you, the council has the ability of looking at the unique characteristics of the lot size, of the location of the project, of the use of the project, the compatibility, um, to evaluate all of those elements and 
evaluate that on an individual basis without setting a new standard in order to create the precedent which you're um, suggesting is that you would need an amendment of the um, of the zoning in a particular area that all of a sudden uh, streets could be a certain width or a certain um, density of a project and things like that. But when you're looking at a plan development, you have that ability to evaluate each project individually without creating the next uh, developer from being able to achieve those same standards since their project will be significantly different. Further questions of staff? Mr. Przinski. If I could get a little bit more follow up on this issue because um, I know that one of the, the concerns of the community has been if the project goes forward at 65 feet and we see in this zoning in the general plan it's, it's a 35 foot height limit with a 50% lot coverage I think is what the, the code says. Um, the, the response has been, well, if, if this is allowed to go forward, then it's a violation of the general plan. And, um, and we know that the general plan is our constitution, it's our guide. But I, I, I want to make it very clear that, that um, and I need this reinforcement if this is what you feel, that as I'm looking at the, uh, at the general plan, it calls out both the 35 foot height and it also calls out plan development. And, um, in the zoning code, it says that if you use one, you would not, it, it, it overlays the other, and the other does not apply, uh, and vice versa. So it's a matter of which you choose. Um, so again, my question is um, directed towards this impression that using a plan development is a violation of general plan, when in, indeed it is, they're both in the general plan. Um, would you comment to that, please? And again, it's, it's the issue. I know that there are some members who have traditionally not believed that uh, plan development is a good way to go. Uh, and yet we have used it and we've had projects, well, for example, Charter Oaks was a plan development. Okay, as well as the uh, as well as the the um, the business park that exists there at this point, um, what what would be the position that the staff has at clarifying that issue? Well, as I said before, you have the general plan parameters of 35 feet and 50 percent, and you also have the special planning areas which allow plan development overlays, because they do allow plan development overlays, which expressly permits the um, setting of specific standards, creates its own zoning ordinance um, for the project. Uh, that gives you the ability to vary from those otherwise um, followed standards for other projects that are not plan developments. If I might follow up, All right. and it's not done whimsically. I mean, it says there are some specific things that we need to to achieve in relationship to to the um, the use of the the plan development overlay. Um, and so the question is, and I, as I understand it, to achieve some goals, you may have to alter other parameters, but it's the intent to achieve some goals. Is, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Spector. Um, what is the distance of the parking garage from the Charter Oaks development? Eighty nine feet. Go ahead. What is the size of the footprint of that garage? The footprint of the garage is 76,715 square feet. You have another question? Sure, certainly. And then um, what percentage of the parking for the entire development does that garage hold?
the parking garage holds 955 spaces. The surface parking is 970. Thank you. Other questions of staff? Madam Mayor, a procedural question. If there's an issue that comes up that we think we need to address to the, to the applicant, um, is it possible at a certain point in time, and I'm not thinking of a question right now, but like just in this exchange, is it possible for us to reopen the public hearing at that point if we have a specific question of the applicant? It's possible at the mayor's sound discretion. Exactly, that was my assumption. <laughs> All right, other questions of staff? Uh, All right, I see no question, further questions of staff. Mayor, uh, we do have the uh, follow-up to Councilwoman Jensen's question on the lighting. Oh, that'd be, okay, great, thank you. Thank Why you. don't you remind us what the question is? So the question related to the lighting, first question was where was the photometric study that is in attachment four, exhibit 14, and it sheets A7.0 through 7.3 three or four, I think. Um, there's also requirements in the California Green Building Code Standards that no direct visible light from interior of buildings can um, go off site, um, cannot leave the building site. So that's the other illumination factor that we typically look at. And so there are other codes through the state that require no direct light to spill off. And so those are done in usually lumens or foot candles, I can't remember which method this was, and so those have proven not to be a significant impact from that perspective. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. Ms. Jensen, it. all right, That's Mr. Fine. Yes, <clears throat> and that reminds me, seeing um, Mr. Moose there, um, we haven't talked about the EIR. And that has been a, a subject that's also occurred. In fact, I was looking at the signs in the, in the, in the room indicating you should think about that. Um, there, the EIR was completed. There was public outreach. There was response to the questions. And I believe that the, the applicant's um, attorney or perhaps your organization did respond to all the questions asked in the uh, inquiry period. Um, I guess my, my question is at this point in time, um, do we evaluate any inconsistencies to, does the staff or the, uh, the individuals who have reviewed this um, see any inconsistencies that might call out um, a question of the EIR as it's uh, currently presented? If your question to me is, do I believe that uh, any of the comments have uh, uh, altered my opinion that the document is legally adequate and defensible in court. The answer is no. I do believe it is legally adequate and defensible in court. All right, thank you. And I did notice that something was somewhat different than the usual expectation I'm seeing in the EIR that every question was responded to, uh, not necessarily you know to be agreed with, but but every question was raised from the public was responded to in the course of the um, the evaluation of those questions. I think we certainly tried to do that. The legal standard actually is there's an obligation to respond in writing to significant environmental issues raised in comments. The courts have never exactly defined that. And so uh, out of an abundance of caution and also to be good uh, responsive uh, staff people, we tried to respond to every single issue. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, council, any further questions of staff? Now seeing none. Um, let me step back a little bit, and uh, as mayor, uh, let me thank you all. Um, this council uh, has listened to uh, about 150 people testify between the council meeting and the planning commission meeting. Uh, as you've heard, uh, we've probably read, we have read, hundreds of emails. The presentations you have made the documentation that you have sent us, no matter what position you have, you have put forward, your uh, presentations and your documents have been extremely well done. Uh, and so as someone who's listening to 150 folks and reading hundreds of emails and documents, I appreciate that very much. I also want to, uh, and what I've been doing, uh, um, over the time that uh, we've had this issue before us, uh, and as you spoke and as you sent in documents, uh, is I have been making a list for myself 
uh, of the issues you have raised. And I just wanted to share with you uh, what a challenging, uh, what a challenging situation we have before us, because every time I came up with an issue, I came up with uh, arguments or positions on both sides or on many sides. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, I also uh, saw precedent uh, as an issue. Uh, and I saw those who would say, well, if you allow the applicant to have a 65-foot building, that will be precedent for the future. Uh, and those will say, well, no, legally that's not the case because this is a planned development. And then others who will say, yes, but if you read uh, the EIR and the staff report, they're always using Netflix, another planned development, as precedent for this one. So the arguments go back and forth. Um, the argument that uh, the application will put money into our schools and into our town, uh, some of you said, well, that's not in our general plan. You can't, uh, you, you can't uh, adopt something because uh, it puts money into our schools and into our towns. Uh, others have said, well, yeah, but that's $1.4 million at 550,000 square feet. And others have said, well, yeah, but that's $890,000 for 350,000 square feet. Uh, the applicant has said that we have a lot of open space with the dis this design by having fewer buildings, then you have more uh, area for trees and greenery. Other folks have said, yeah, but uh, you could still have shorter buildings and have that same amount of open space. There have been those that have argued that uh, you have a return of investment of 7%, which requires 500,000 square feet at $4 per square foot. Then we get paperwork that says, yeah, but at $4.62 per square foot, apparently what Netflix has signed up for, you have a 7.4 return on investment. We have people who say, Larry Cannon, our architect for the town, says this is a good design. Other people will say, well, yes, but it would be a good design if it weren't so tall also. There were some people who say that adding 3,000 uh, cars to the Winchester Lark area uh, is not a significant impact. Uh, and I think it was F FJKM Transportation Consultant said that as part of the EIR. And then there are those of us who live in town, and I think Tom O'Donnell said it for the Planning Commission, you know, you, you read that and you hear it, but it just in your gut it seemed counterintuitive. Um, there are those who will say, yes, but Netflix, I mean, there's, I'll tell you one thing that you all agreed on. You like Netflix, all right? And, um, and so they say, look to the fact that Netflix is giving us a 10-year lease, and that's the future of our town. And then other people will say, Yes, but you are making decisions for our future. And the current buildings were there for 40 years. You are not just looking at 10 years. You are looking to the future. Height comes up a lot. There are some, the, the um, environmental impact report says that the uh, height is less than significant impact. But then there are people who testify and give us uh, documents that say that the impact is significant. Another thing that everybody had, the second thing that you had a consensus on, agreement on, you like Class A office space. Everybody likes Class A office space. But then some folks say, well, yeah, but to have good Class A office space, you need the 65 feet. Other folks say, well, no, you don't. You just need a good infrastructure, specifically the, uh, the wiring and the air conditioning, that it's defined by infra infrastructure. Some people say, well, we need the parking garage uh, and that you can't go uh, underneath, you can't go underground because it's not environmentally sound to go underground. And then other folks say, well, in a short term that might be the case, but in the long term it might be uh, the, a better way to go. So uh, I don't even know if those are all the issues. Those are all that I was writing down as I was reading all of this stuff uh, and thinking about it. And so I just have to circle back when I, when I read all of that and I listen to all of that. Um, and um, I have always, I was on the Planning Commission uh, for eight years back in the 80s. Uh, and even back then, when I first started out, uh, I always felt that good land use decisions 
uh, were based on our, our laws. And that if you make good land use decisions, you have economic vitality in your town. And that's what I think we have seen in Los Gatos. Um, so then I go to the, the, uh, our town uh, and the, the laws that we have, and I looked at the draft EIR, uh, and it had somewhere at the beginning the 2020 general plan vision statement, and it talked about right off the get-go, the human scale of development, the view of the hills, the fabric of the community, all right, and this was very interesting to me because uh, especially recently with input we've had from other jurisdictions. The fabric of the community is why each, or each jurisdiction, each town, each city has its own land use because each jurisdiction establishes the fabric of its community. I think Los Gatos is like the best it could ever be. But I, I will tell you right now, Santa Clara wouldn't want to be uh, Los Gatos or have Los Gatos land use. You know, they want their, their big streets and they want the, the football stadium. San Jose wouldn't want to be Palo Alto. Palo Alto probably doesn't want to be Los Gatos. So when you look at the fabric of the community, you're looking at rules and laws and standards that are developed for that city, for that town. And I admit uh, there, there, some people might find one thing in the general plan uh, that they like. Other folks might find uh, other things. Uh, but I agree with a report that actually came from the developer that the ultimate discretion of what values you choose from your general plan lie with the council. So having said that, uh, I am going to uh, suggest to the council that they turn to page two of our May 20th, 2013 staff report. And why I'm suggesting you turn to that, uh, it's because that is where the staff has laid out the uh, motions uh, that they suggest uh, on this matter, on this application. And I will uh, represent to, uh, or to uh, not represent, but just tell the staff and the council as I go through this, uh, I'm going to be making one omnibus uh, motion. Uh, I'm gonna be following the staff's uh, outline here, uh, understanding that for the first one doesn't even need a motion, but I'm going to include it. And so reading from uh, the second page of the staff's report, uh, and based on, uh, based on the, uh, my analysis and discussion and input that I've just, um, that I've just relayed to you, I'm gonna uh, move that we accept the report of the Planning Commission's recommendations in the form of meeting minutes. I'm going to adopt the CEQA findings of fact and certify the environmental, let's see, certify the environmental impact report, including the errata sheets, adopt the mitigation monitoring and reporting program, and adopt the resolution certifying the environmental document. I'm going to make the required findings supporting the zone change and approve the plan development application subject to the performance standards and development plans included in the planned development or as otherwise modified. I'm going to move to waive the reading of the zone change ordinance. I'm going to move to introduce the ordinance to effectuate the zone, zone change. I'm going to make the required findings for approval of the architecture and site application and approve the architecture and site application subject to the conditions of approval and development plans or as otherwise modified by the town council and I'm going to modify uh, those plans as follows. I mean, modify the application as follows. That buildings one and four will have a 50 foot height maximum, and that is the total inclusive height maximum. That there will be no freeway uh, signage whatsoever. That the garage will be two stories 
if it maintains the solar panels, if it removes the solar panels, it can stay at three stories, and also uh, it could go uh, underground if the developer uh, and the town so chose. And that is the totality of my motion. Do I have a second? Ms. Jensen? Madam Mayor, thank you. Um, I would love to say to all of you what she said, but you are owed much better than that. Um, I agree with many of the comments that the mayor made, not all. Uh, sometimes it's very helpful, I've found, to identify what something is not as opposed to what it is. And what this is not is a Netflix campus or Netflix project. What it is is a proposal for a Los Gatos Business Park, LLC, that's brought to us by Mr. Shank and Mr. Powell for four office buildings for a total of 550,000 square feet. Netflix has signed a lease for one of those buildings, one, uh, for 10 years, and it has an option on the rest. However, it is not a Netflix campus. It is not a Netflix project. So if we were to modify this project, we are not saying to Netflix, go away. We are simply saying to Mr. Shank and the developer, perhaps there should be a compromise that's considered, and here's why it should be. And one of those reasons is that we as a town council, and I also was on the planning commission for many years, uh, we are obligated to plan for the town. And our land use planning is dictated by our general plan, by our land use policies, by our hillside specific plan, by our downtown commercial guidelines, by our historic preservation guidelines, by our, I can't even think of them all now. But when a body plans for a single use, it has abdicated its responsibility to plan. So many of you at our last meeting talked about the auto dealerships, and as you'll recall, there was a time when the auto dealerships provided the vast majority of the revenue to the town. They're gone for, uh, because of economic downturns, because of whatever, but I absolutely remember sitting in meetings for the Los Gatos uh, Boulevard plan, listening to auto dealers tell us that we must rename auto Los Gatos Boulevard to Los Gatos Auto Mall and put that sign on the freeway because that's what our town needed. I'm not saying that Netflix is asking for this, but imagine how, if we had done that, then we would be Marine World Parkway. We need to plan for the town of Los Gatos. There have been a lot of arguments regarding the economic benefits of the project as proposed. It brings us economic benefits even if modified. And we've heard arguments about diversity in the town, economic benefits for our schools. Las Gatos is primarily a residential community. Its property taxes are primarily paid for by residences. We sustain the value of those residences and thus the revenue for our town from those residences by maintaining the standards that we've always maintained for the quality of life and the character that is our town. If we abandon those, we may lose property tax revenue in other places. That's the residential part of the argument. The business part of the argument is that our mayor, uh, I've learned, had the privilege of meeting with what I'm gonna call, uh, excuse me, Ms. Capri, but a growing hot company which occupies an attic space over uh, California Cafe. That company and its representatives wondered where they could find a 10,000 to 15,000 square foot space for them to grow, or where they could find affordable housing. And because they're downtown, they come and eat lunch every day. So they are contributing to the vibrant economic fabric of this community. And we can't ignore those for the company that has grown, which is Netflix. And bless its heart, Netflix has grown. But there are those companies out there that need the space to grow. And Los Gatos needs to provide that space. And we also can't look at businesses as high tech. Yes, we're in Silicon Valley. But how does the proposed project supply office space to an architect, to a law firm? to a design company, to a PR firm, to an advertising agency. We can't look, we can't focus on one thing and keep um, our community vital. Everyone, as the mayor said, agrees that we need Class A art office space. The only question is what form should that take? That's the only question. And the EIR calls out for us a reduced intensity alternative 
which is at 50, 350,000 square feet. The mayor didn't mention that in, in her motion, so I'm going to mention a couple of things and see if she'll agree with that. As, uh, one would be to reduce the square footage to 350,000 square feet. Uh, I agree that the bu buildings that impact uh, the freeway and Charter Oaks uh, should be lower. I was going to suggest 45 feet. I can live with 50, which I think the mayor indicated. I would ask the mayor to consider requiring the undergrounding of the garage. Uh, because I don't particularly see a reason not to. Um, those are the things that I would look for to see if the mayor would agree with. With respect to, um, oh, the other thing that I would ask the mayor to consider is putting in as a condition of, of approval the don't block this area in front of Charter Oaks Drive that was mentioned earlier. Um, I guess the final thing I would say is in response to, I, I feel I need to respond to some things that have been brought up. Uh, it is a tradition, that, uh, as I've learned, as being a member of the Planning Commission in Los Gatos, that everybody is considered. I can't tell you how many times I sat at a meeting and asked a single family homeowner to frost over a window because their neighbor was concerned about their privacy. So it is totally fair and reasonable for this council to consider the interests of an entire neighborhood uh, that is near a creek, which is an asset to our community as well. So I'm not offended or by the arguments that the Charter Oak neighbors bring to us. Uh, thank you for raising those. Thank you to everybody who's uh, contributed. Uh, your presentations were so good that I'm embarrassed not to have a better speech for you or have, have a uh, PowerPoint or something. Um, but so, Mayor, I would ask you to consider those amendments um, to the motion. I am seconding it. Um, as I think I made clear, but it asks you to consider those items that I mentioned. All right, I'm going to have to uh, have a procedural um, um, procedural questions, and this will be directed to you, Ms. Jensen. Um, did you are you seconding the motion that I made? I am, and then I'm asking you to consider addendums to it. Um, with regard. I figure I better take this one at the good part and then work toward the bad part. Um, with regard to uh, adding a provision of that Charter Oaks will don't have don't block uh, on um, Lark Avenue, uh, I would uh, include that as part of my motion. Um, with regard to the 45 feet versus 50 feet. Um, the reason I had the 50 as all-inclusive is I, um, I would anticipate that the buildings, buildings one and four, would be 45 feet um, and that they would have another five feet for uh, other things that we now have learned go on the top of the building. Uh, so so if you want me to, to address them as you go, Given that explanation, I could go with the 50 feet, but the substantive portion of the building, uh, I would like to make clear, is 45 feet. Yes, it is, and that was my intent of my motion. Uh, I would have a question about requiring the undergrounding uh, of the parking garage. That was not uh, a part of my motion. So what do you mean by that? I think that your motion was suggest to the developer and the staff that it might be undergrounded. I am troubled at what the reaction might be to that, so I would rather have either a height limit on the existing garage, removing solar panels, or undergrounding so that the garage doesn't go over 35 feet. All right, let me uh, address that. Um, with regard to the garage, uh, I understand now that it's 35 feet. Uh, let me confirm that. That's correct. All right, and the, it gains extra height uh, if uh, solar panels are installed. And so my motion was um, if you're going to have the solar panels, have two stories. If you're not going to have the solar panel, you can have three stories, which is 35 feet. And the option is always there to underground. Is that not acceptable to you? That's fine now as stated because it's very specific that the overall height shall not exceed 35 feet under any circumstances. Okay. All right, and then with regard to your request that I limit the um, 
total square footage to 350,000 square feet. Um, I don't believe, uh, I know that if you remove uh, one story from buildings one and four, the square footage will not be reduced to 350,000 square feet. Um, I don't have my calculator here with me, uh, but we're probably looking at 400 and something like 450,000 square feet, and I would leave my motion at that uh, and not reduce it to 350,000. Given the other concerns and the arguments that I've raised in the motion and uh, making it very clear that at least this council person does not consider plan developments to be a precedent for any future development and that they are used, I think, incorrectly to create ad hoc development, uh, I would make a, an exception to see if we can move this forward, if they're, depending upon what the vote is. We'll see how it goes, and if we can get it down lower, I may be in a position to try to do that. But for now, um, I'll second the motion. All right. We have a motion that has been seconded. Discussion, Mr. Brzezinski. Yes, Madam Mayor. appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, <coughs> the, um, the concern I have is with probably... Um, the 450 limit. My assumption is that the 550, um, if that were to stay in place, and I think that's what your original motion was, Madam Mayor, was 550. No, because I am reducing, I am eliminating uh, one floor off of two buildings, so that wouldn't be possible. Well, the reason why I say that is that the issue of buildings one and four is height, if that is your intent. And I see the possibility of, of actually uh, increasing the footprint of those buildings if done appropriately so that the 550,000 square feet could still be captured. I don't think 350,000 square feet necessarily um, is a magic number. I think the issue is can we um, allow the, the uh, 550 as proposed um, with appropriate, um, with appropriate opportunity to reconfigure that campus in such a way that we, we secure and maintain the treescape, that um, that would be eliminated if we went to the the full build out at the, the 35 350 as was originally proposed, but I, I you know I think this is something that we need to ask of the applicant at a certain point to see if there is some feasibility in their doing this. Um, I do have a feeling that this is about Netflix. We've all agreed. Um, Netflix is significant to this community. It is, it is uh, a, a, uh, an organization that was created here. Um, and some people may not feel it's significant, but I do. And I think that um, to, uh, to necessarily um, not include that as part of our plan is, is short-sighted. Um, I also believe that Class A office is essential to this community. I think this is the appropriate site for that. Um, and, and whether Netflix stays beyond 10 years or the other buildings um, are occupied by other uh, corporations that require Class A office, I think that's all beneficial to us. The thing that I would be less than enthusiastic about the motion is the reduction of the, of the 550 to 450, only because so much of what is predicated on the, the benefit to the community re re relates directly to the square footage. And I, I do not want to discount all of the comments made in our last meeting two weeks ago, um, so many of which were very clear that you know, we, we are a community that thrives not just because of architecture or not just because of our view shed, but that in addition to those things that allow us to continue to thrive as a community. And you know, I, I do believe that it would be risky for us to discount and just assume that in, uh, in so discounting that square footage possibility, which I think could be achieved under the mayor's under the mayor's original motion, um, that that would be detrimental to us. Um, I, I I do know for a fact that there are an awful lot of communities in this valley that would um, are right now interested 
and encouraging Netflix to come. Um, I do think that uh, some of the communities that are immediately adjacent to us are making that, that inquiry. Um, I don't think we should be naive in the fact that at a certain point in time we need to move forward. Being at this for three years, I, I do think it's time to move forward tonight. And I do appreciate the, the mayor's motion. Um, I, you know, I do believe that good land use is based on the real community that we're engaged with. I appreciated the, the responses of a lot of the individuals who came to the microphone uh, on both sides. But I, I think that in the reality, you know, the fact that um, we have a lot of people who are defining community, not just by the view shed, not just, including, but not just the view shed, but a lot of the other values, all of the other values that we're inclined to try to achieve. And one of those is a sense of community that we engage with each other. And one of the things that I've, you know, I've been upset by on occasion, and it's only been on occasion, is kind of the, the adversarial tone that this has taken in some ways. Okay. I, I really think that when we look at this in its, in its whole context, um, we have to remember that we all care about the community, no matter which side we're on, but we don't isolate someone from the other side as not a worthy or valid member of our community. And I do think that that's really significant for us to keep in mind as we go forward. But uh, Madam Mayor, I would ask you to, to consider the issue that one revise that I'm looking at there, and that's the 450 versus 550. And in addition, I think it might be appropriate for the mayor uh, to reopen the session to hear from the applicant whether or not the motion as stated um, would be viable. We can, as far as I'm concerned, approve the motion whether or not it makes sense for the applicant. But I do think that it's necessary for us to, to have that inquiry to determine, uh, at least with that information, how we can best vote. Uh, thank you. At this point, we'll go forward with uh, council discussion, if there is any. Ms. McNutt. Um, thank you, Mayor. I, I have um, some procedural questions on this. Um, I, I do think that in both the PD and the ANS, there is a square footage maximum number that has to be included. So I think we need to come to some conclusion as to what that is, and I don't know what the elimination of those two floors would do to that, that number. So that's, that's number one. Number two is with these kind of changes, I don't see how we can, how, how do we, I won't say I don't see, how do we approve the ANS with these kinds of um, changes? So that's a question, I guess, for staff. And then um, I also would actually like to hear from you what the what your thinking is on those two why those two particular buildings, what impacts you think they're having that dropping 15 feet in each case will will do. That would be helpful to me. Thank you for the discussion, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Specter. Um, I also felt that 350 was too low. However, the number I was leaning towards was 400. If this council finds merit in 450, I think I can live with that. Um, I have a difficult time with all four of the buildings being uh, 45 plus the five foot screening. I believe that the buildings closest to the freeway and the building closest to Charter Oaks should be a max height of 35 feet. And I think that could be achieved with the lower square footage. Originally, I had been hoping that th there would be um, more concerns about underground parking. Um, the current Netflix site, I believe, has 50% of their parking underground. And I was the reason why I asked the questions about the parking garage and how many spots are uh, in the garage and how many spots are at the surface level is because it seems about 50% is going into that garage. And the garage in its current proposed form um, at about two acres times about four stories high, about 89 feet from Charter Oaks, I think represents a big um, burden for the residents. However, the motion was made to reduce the, the garage to a height of 35 feet. Um, however, I, I, I still am an advocate of underground parking. Um, 
I do also agree with solar panels being at street level if they are to be used and not on top of garages or buildings. There's 2.7 acres of easements that Los Gatos um, has in the development, and I think the town needs to be compensated for that. Perhaps some appraisals need to be done. I think there needs to be some um, significant screening along the Charter Oak side. Um, I know there is proposed screening now, but I think we have to really consider um, evergreen trees or something, more expensive trees or more quantities of trees to um, help block out the illumination of the future proposed buildings. And then last but not least, the corner of Lark and Winchester um, is a piece of property that we own. And to me, that, that property, um, currently we have a Goodwill truck on it. Um, sometimes it's used as a construction staging area. Sometimes it's used as a pumpkin patch or a Christmas tree lot. And the client um, or the applicant um, a proposed community benefit of $550,000 towards traffic improvements, which I believe will get used up in quite a hurry considering we're looking at as many as four or five intersections being redone. And we had just spent about half a million dollars a piece on two different intersections, one on Knowles and Winchester and one on University and Lark. So I believe that figure is quite low. Um, in addition, the applicant has um, offered to allow us to have some of their dirt, some of their uh, off-haul in our creek uh, area to help, uh, I guess, prevent future flooding, which we greatly appreciate, but that's really a convenience for the applicant. And to me, the corner of uh, Lark and Winchester with its ingress and egress and the increasing traffic all the time represents a real safety problem. We have no driveway there. We have no sidewalk on that corner. I feel like there should be a sidewalk connecting um, the properties on University Avenue going all the way over to the residents on Winchester around the corner and perhaps um, some low um, maintenance or um, low impact landscaping there and um, remove the whatever arrangement we have with the Goodwell trucks. Although I use them, I find it convenient. I just feel like at this point in time until that property finds a new owner and as this project moves forward, that needs to be addressed. Um, perhaps a similar uh, application as the aquifier ponds that I believe are located on Sunny Oaks Avenue in Winchester, just a piece of property that's there but not being used for ingress and egress. So, um, I don't know if some of these things can be considered by the makers of the motions, but I'm open. And the seconder. Uh, thank you. Um, at this juncture, uh, my motion stands. Um, I just wanted to address some of the issues uh, that were raised. Uh, first of all, when I read your materials and listen to you, I don't necessarily see sides. Yeah, there are some people who want the project just as it uh, is and other people who don't want it at all or want it very small. But there are a lot of you who gave us materials that were not just sides. There was just a spectrum of input. Um, with regard to the 450,000, uh, I have a lot of stuff with me tonight. Calculator is not one of them. Uh, but. Um, the materials say that we have a 550,000 square foot total. Uh, I calculated that at 34,375 feet per floor. Two floors, 68,750 feet. So you go 550,000 minus 68,750, and that's as far as I got while uh, everybody was talking. Uh, so it is not exactly 450,000. Uh, with regard to a larger footprint, because two floors have been, um, in my motion, uh, two floors have been removed, uh, I am not willing to uh, amend my motion to uh, include a larger footprint uh, to, uh, to uh, make up for the square footage that's lost by the two floors. Uh, and with regard to why one and four, um, the, the uh, testimony that we received uh, focused on uh, number four, which was by Charter Oaks. And in looking at the materials provided to us, mainly by the applicant, uh, it was building one uh, that loomed uh, on 85 and on Winchester. Uh, so that was uh, the reason for that part of it. Is there further discussion? Ms. McNutt. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor. I do need to find out from the attorneys whether or not we need a specific square footage um, in this motion for the PD. And then secondly, can we approve an ANS application with this many changes? Yes, the ANS part, um, we would ask council to provide direction whether the ANS would be um, approved by staff at the DRC, by the consulting architect, back to the planning commission or back to the council. At a minimum, we would recommend that the consulting architect review the revised design for buildings one and four uh, to ensure that the elimination of one story retains the same character and feel of the architecture that was previously reviewed and presented to council. Um, so that's for the ANS approval. For the square footage, the mayor's calculations matched what Joel and I separately did. The new number would be around 480,000 if the uh, council were to include a specific number in the PD and ANS. I, um, it may be slightly larger if the top floors, which I believe they were with balconies and the like, are smaller. So if the top floor was taken off, but that would be subject to consulting architect input, um, maybe it'd get up to 500. I, I do not know. Um, we'll leave it to the attorney whether the actual square footage needs to be specified in there that is common for your actions to include a square footage. Uh, there could be a resulting calculation left to the consulting architect and staff and reported out to PC and council. Um, but it would be in the 480 to 500 range if you were to specify a square footage. The last issue is the viability of the project is not something staff's able to assess. With respect to the square footage, it's traditional in a PD so that uh, staff can work with the applicant when the project comes in to make sure that it meets the PD to at least put in a square footage that as um, proposed that it would be up to um, so that you have a maximum that it can't go over. In this case, um, since there it does need to be uh, some redesign, um, that we would recommend um, maybe a uh, higher square footage and up to, but with clear indication um, by the uh, of the preferred range um, of of whatever this council decides that um, that 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 would be your preference that when certain structures are reduced in height that the total square footage be approximately X with a no, no not to exceed or up to um, a small uh, adjustment of ranges to allow for architectural variances. I also took as explicit in the mayor's comment uh, to the prior comments and maybe it, or implicit and it should be made explicit that the square footage or the floor plate, uh, the footprint wouldn't change of the buildings uh, and that would probably be the way to accommodate the mayor's statement. That's correct and uh, quite frankly I didn't quite understand uh, what staff was just saying with regard to the requirement for square footage numbers, uh, but it's the square footage number that's in this motion is 550,000 less 68,750. Mr. Przinski. And given the staff's comment, um, would the mayor consider in this motion to indicate the square footage of the total at up to up to 500, okay? To me, it, it seems that the, the 485 or whatever it was that you arrived at um, is something that is not necessary and that there is a value to the community of having a larger square footage, even though it doesn't fit some of the people's interests, but I think the major issue is the, is the four-story height. I really think that's the major issue. Some of you don't believe it. I think that's really what the major issue for most of the people who have expressed the concern. And it relates to view sheds uh, from Winchester, and it also relates to the impacts of the neighbors in uh, Charter Oaks. Um, and you know, I, I want to make sure that we're making decisions based on on real life issues and not um, something that that uh, we have come up with that doesn't necessarily have. 
um, a grounding in fact. I think so much of what we've been talking about needs to be grounded in some degree of, uh, of analysis. And for me, I, I don't think it, we risk anything to say that we're, we're going to expect that if it stays within the footprint, it doesn't go beyond, that is the total square footage, doesn't go beyond 500. Further discussion? Ms. Jensen. Uh, as the seconder of the motion, I would, as, as I indicated earlier, I was coming in here at 350. Vice Mayor Leonardis was coming in at 400 square thousand feet. Uh, I can live with 450. I can't live with 500. Um, I respectfully disagree with Councilman Przinski about what the issue is. If I look at our draft EIR regarding the reduced intensity alternative, a less, lesser square footage not only re reduces aesthetic impacts, but it also serves to reduce impacts on traffic, noise, air quality, greenhouse gases, recreation, utilities, and service systems, and energy resources. Um, all of the five intersections impacted by this development, that impact would be lessened by lesser square footage. It's to me, it's sort of easy to, I am not a math genius and I am not going to be, I'm trying to do the subtraction that the mayor was talking about, can't do that. But what I can do is figure out how many people can fit in a certain amount of space. And if you have less square footage, you're probably going to have less people coming to the building, which to me means less traffic impact, um, noise impact, greenhouse gas impact. So it's not just about the view shed and the height. It's about all of the impacts that are identified as part of the reduced intensity alternative that's contained in our DEIR. -E and I would respectfully ask the mayor if she would consider a specific top out limit at 450,000 square feet. Madam Mayor. Mr. Przinski. I, I certainly appreciate uh, Councilwoman Jensen's point of view, but I don't think it's just a matter of mathematics. And in considering, in considering all of those factors, we're not e excluding greenhouse gases or, or the, the impacts of traffic and so forth. But I do think that you know, if we just go on the mathematical model, then we stop, we stop some of our, our more, um, more realistic perception. Um, the idea that, that that square footage is by its very nature going to lead to a significant impact when our EIR says it's not at the current square footage. I, I want us to be very cautious of jumping to conclusions based not necessarily on the evaluation of our environmental impact report, but on a mathematical calculation that suddenly puts us in a situation where um, the world as we know it is going to come to an end. And I think there's been a lot of that kind of conversation in this. I, I don't believe that this is going to be of significant impact, but um, you know, I do want us to come to closure tonight. I want us to, to be able to make a decision tonight for sure so that we can move forward. And, um, and I would ask that the mayor, given the motion, um, inquire of the applicant um, some form of response to this because I do think that we need, we deserve to have that response and the applicant deserves to be able to make the response. Um, and so that would in, you know, entail opening the public hearing for, for just the applicant at this point. All right, I will not be opening the, reopening the public hearing. Uh, further discussion by the council. Ms. McNutt. Um, thank you, Mayor. I'm sorry, so just to clarify one more time, what's your number that you've come up with? If someone has a calculator and do, the, do this math here. 481,250. I'm sorry, 491? 481, 250. If every floors, if the average of all the floors were the two floors eliminated, each floor is different. And that, that's the number that you have, 481, 250? Well, actually, I have 471, 250, but I have scribbles. So <laughs> I'll go with 481, 481 250. 250. Okay. Um, and then, so. Um, <laughs> This is interesting. Uh, it, it's like I don't know whether to support the motion or not because um, I, I've not heard the justification yet as to why we are changing what was proposed. And 
Um, I, you know, I, I have five pages of comments, um, which I will not give you all right now, but I do want to give you a couple of highlights, and that is we've all talked about what we heard uh, both in public testimony and through the emails and the common themes in all of those. And the two common themes that I heard was we love Las Gatas and do the right thing. Now, the problem is do the right thing was defined in a whole lot of different ways. Um, so as has been referenced, what we have to go back to is the general plan. And I look at the general plan and I don't see a bedroom community. I see uh, language in the general plan in the vision statement that talks about the importance of having a vibrant business community, of having a full range of businesses. We always talk about from the lawnmower repair shop to the corporate campus. Uh, we rely, uh, residential property tax is what, 25, 30% of our income, sales tax another quarter percent, commercial property, property tax. Uh, you know, we have always taken pride in this community in being a, a full service community in the sense of having a full range of residential types, a full range of business types, and it all works together. And that's what helps to create that small town atmosphere. We also, in our last general plan update in 2010, spent a lot of time working in language to talk about environmental uh, friendliness and sustainability. And what we heard in testimony, uh, both verbal and written, is the desire for people, and it was repeated again tonight, to be able to, to work in the community where they live. Not all of us can buy our $3 million house if we are a clerk in a coffee shop in downtown. What are the incomes that allow us to buy into Las Gatas? Well, first of all, if you bought in 1972, like I did, then you don't have to worry about it. But for the ones that are coming in now, you have to be working in, uh, in a job that reflects the Silicon Valley economy, and that primarily is technology. We've talked about, and someone again mentioned it either tonight or in the last meeting, how we take great pride in the fact that some of the best and brightest minds of the world center of technology and innovation live in Las Gatas. They sleep in Las Gatas. So shouldn't we allow them to work in Las Gatas also? And creating this kind of corporate campus and giving it enough uh, space and quality and the campus feel, I think, is, um, is very important. And it very much reflects the spirit and the vision of, um, of the general plan. There's also a lot of conversation about this small town Feel. And again, just like do the right thing has a whole spectrum of definitions, so does what is small town. Someone told us that there are 18 references to small town in the general plan. And I didn't go back and do a, do a check and count it all up. I'll, I'll, I'll accept that as being fact. But what is not in the general plan is a very specific definition of what is small town. And at some point in this whole process, I thought, what is small town? So I went to the source of all truth, I went to Google, and I said, what is a small town? Got a whole range of definitions, and some of them are very flattering, and we heard some of those tonight, it's talking about community and people, and warmth and support, and, um, and unique and friendly. And some of them, again, we heard public testimony last time, are not so, are not so nice. Small town is unsophisticated, that's not Las Gatas. We're not unsophisticated. This is a very sophisticated community. Small-minded, that was one of the uh, people mentioned that. That is not the Las Gatas that I know. So uh, this whole idea of I say this is what small town is and this is what it's not, again, we all have to remember we've got 30,000 residents here and probably 30,000 definitions of exactly what that small town should be. So. We have a motion on the table, and the decision I am, uh, again, I'm struggling with is I don't want to um, vote against it and in any way imply that I am not supportive of the idea of a corporate campus and supportive of the idea of uh, what is being proposed here. But um, to support it, I, you know, I sure wish that I would have had a little bit more explanation as to why it needs to change and really what benefits come from the changes that are being proposed. I have a feeling I'm not going to get that, so in about 30 seconds, I'm going to have to decide. But I thank you for the time. 
For further discussion, Mr. Vice Mayor. I mean, Mr. Vice Mayor, just let me jump in here. Uh, it seems like I have uh, universal challenges with my motion, but since Ms. Jensen um, seconded the motion, uh, let me just clarify her question, uh, which was reduce the 481,250 to a 450,000 blanket number. Uh, I will say um, I am not willing to make that change. Uh, given that, uh, are you still going to second the motion or will you withdraw it? I will still second the motion. Um, 481,250 seems odd to put into an ordinance. So I'm wondering if you could have a maximum of 482 or something like that, or 480. So at least it's something that, to me at least, makes some sort of common sense. All right, well, we'll swing back to that. That might be okay. I just wanted to make sure we were not uh, discussing a motion that was no longer the table. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Spector. Um, just responding to some of the comments made by Councilwoman McNutt. Um, this is one project, and it's very idealistic to believe that we may solve all of our housing needs or all of our employment needs or all of our school funding needs with one project. Um, but the fact of the matter is there's 160,000 square feet sitting right next to this proposed, whether it be 400, 550, or 500, or 482,000 square foot um, campus. And there are future opportunities. There are future opportunities for housing and more um, class A office space down the road and I feel like there's this attitude that if I get to the buffet table first I'll be able to eat all the good stuff and the guys who come later are not going to get the get as much because the reports and the um, impacts will be different for them um, so again I'm if if the choices are 450, 482, or 500, I say we we round one way or the or the other. I mean, I would be inclined to go towards 450, not because it's an arbitrary number, but when I came up with the number of 400, I thought, well, the applicant said he needs 35 to 40 thousand square foot floor plates, and I figured, okay, you can have two buildings that are 80,000 square feet, 40,000 square foot floor plates. That's what Silicon Valley wants. That's what we've been told over and over here by realtors and developers and everybody else who has, has supported the idea. And um, those are the current sizes of the two existing Netflix buildings, which is quite substantial amount of square footage. Then I thought, well, Netflix has at least 140,000 square feet. Um, they have a commitment for that in 140,000 can be supported by a 35 or 40,000 foot square foot floor plate. And then I thought, well, what do you got left? You got 140 and you have, you know, 80 and 80. So that leaves you with a, a balance of 100. And I thought, well, 100,000 could be sorted out with 35,000 or 33,000 or 40,000 somehow. Um, so it was moving towards the more preferred um, impact in the environmental impact report. It wasn't going with the 350,000 square foot uh, presented by members of the public and the Venn diagrams and all those things we've seen. It wasn't um, taking the approach to take it or leave it or um, all or none or um, take it or else that was presented um, many times over. Um, it was a compromise of what is something that will work, what is something that will be respectful of the view shed, where um, it will respect the, the existing residents of Charter Oaks in their environment and their property values and, and um, their, their life, what, what they expected when they bought their properties and when they moved in, yet it would still allow for vitality. I mean, it would be, whether it's 400 or 450 or 480, um, a lot more Class A office space than we have. Granted, there is 250,000 square feet there, but that's going to get bulldozed and replaced. So um, if it's 400 or 450, that's 450,000 or 400,000 more Class A office space than we have now. And I think that's quite a bit. Um, again, we have 160,000 sitting there right next to it. So. Um, I would be more inclined to move towards the 
um, maybe the middle ground of the environmental impact report and um, the, the middle number of 450. Further discussion, Mr. Brzezinski. There will be a quiz at the end of the session tonight. <laughs> I hope you took notes. Um, this is why we decided a long time ago not to design from the dais. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to recommend to the mayor that you know you round your number however you will, but um, but I, I would I would recommend I don't know if it's 485 or, or whatever would be appropriate, um, and and allow the applicant to work within that number. Um, I I really you know I'm I am sorry that the mayor is not going to allow some response from the applicant. Only in this regard, I have no idea what their interest is. I have no, none whatsoever. Um, and they could say this is doable and it could make the decision for Councilwoman McNutt easier or for me easier or for any of us easier. Or they could say this is not doable and I could still vote for it. So, I mean, my, my issue is not knowing kind of leaves out one piece of information that I would like to have at this point in time. But I would respect the mayor's judgment on that. And, uh, but I would like to, to see if we could not, you know, kind of come to closure on the number. And uh, again, the number that I think you called out 485 as a rounded number would probably be satisfactory. I don't think it's going to break the, break the bank. Further discussion? Well, let, uh, let me say that um, it was not, I don't believe in uh, designing from the dais either, uh, but uh, the numbers I had to work with uh, were the numbers uh, in the plan, uh, and so those were the numbers I was using. So, but to make life easier, staff, this motion will be 485,000 if the seconder of the motion agrees. Yes. I'm pulling teeth. All right, so that's where we are now. Uh, Mr. Vice Mayor. Can uh, we read back what the motion is in its entirety? <laughs> I can do it. Yes. <clears throat> it is uh, to approve staff recommendation with all of the actions on page two with the following modifications. Buildings one and four would be limited to 50 feet maximum, all inclusive of screening, uh, uh, mechanical, and other accoutrements. There would be second, no freeway oriented signage or freeway visible signage. I wasn't sure the mayor's specification there. I don't know what wording uh, that staff uses. I don't want to see any uh, signage on the freeway. Okay. However, no you freeway say that. visible signage. Uh, the taking the combination of the motion, motion maker and the seconder. The garages would be limited to 35 feet maximum, all inclusive of mechanical screening and solar panels, panels with underground parking possible with subsequent review. Fourth, the square footage for the entire project, uh, office project would be limited to 485,000 square feet and there would be a requirement to provide keep clear or equivalent markage and signage at the intersection of Charter Oaks and Lark. That's what I've heard discussed. Staff did have uh, one item that may have been neglected because it was encompassed in the very first staff report was the applicant's offer of community benefit at a dollar per square foot of constructed office space. So that condition would have to be added and we have proposed language for that. And then there's the direction on for the buildings one and four with the elimination of a floor, there does need to be a follow on ANS review which staff would recommend be done by the consulting architect. All right, uh, for the maker of the motion, that's all fine. I don't know what, uh, when you said with subsequent review, what was that? It would be that the, if the applicant proceeds with building or when the applicant, if and when the applicant proceeds with buildings one and four, there would be revised architecture presented for buildings one and four that show the elimination of the floor. And those would go to the consulting architect to ensure consistency with the quality and focus of the designs in the uh, official development plans as submitted. Thank you. Mr. Vice Mayor. So for clarification, um, 
the height of buildings one and four is 50 feet as 50 proposed, feet 50 feet as proposed by the, motion. By the mayor yeah. all inclusive all inclusive and I left out with no increase in footprint for those or other buildings mr. vice mayor in regards to the um, Charter Oaks development and the height of that building perhaps in exchange for 15,000 more square feet making it 500,000 square feet could we reduce the height of that building to 35 feet and then add square footage in the other buildings or what all right um, I'm gonna uh, respond the same way I did to other folks uh, at this point my motion stands uh, and uh, I'm not prepared to change it uh, if somebody would like to move uh, to amend this motion um, please do but I'm not prepared to agree to change it Miss Jensen since you're the seconder as a seconder of the motion I I would not support that compromise because I think there are impacts created by the square footage and I would not want to start bartering about those impacts um, I should say that I would normally advocate sending any ac architectural changes back to the Planning Commission for their review uh, however I think that it's important that this council reach a definitive decision that we don't have anything outstanding um, so that parties can go forward how they think it's best to go forward and the town can respond or the applicant can respond so I would accept having it sent back to the architect in this instance only thank you for the discussion mr. Przinski first of all I agree with uh, councilwoman Jensen on that last point um, and I, I need to get the clarification on the parking structure um, because there were in the mayor's initial motion it was three stories without without solar array and then if you want to do the solar array you drop it so is that how the manager framed it and that was my my understanding of the motion I, I did reframe the original motion based on the discussion between the motion maker and the seconder um, what becomes a challenge in that is that there were elevator overruns that regardless of the solar panels being on top of the 35 feet would exist above the 35 feet and so that would um, reduce the available parking I should also mention uh, before you go any further uh, we have why don't you tell me what the motion is again on the garage Let's make sure that the ma the motion maker and the seconder agree okay. uh, and then tell me what your challenge is with it okay sure the original motion was the garage is limited to two stories or three stories with no solar panels and underground parking would be allowed then following the discussion on the 35 feet maximum height I incorporated that in the revised motion to be garage at 35 feet maximum uh, all inclusive of mechanical solar panels and screening with underground parking possible with subsequent review I probably overstated the revised motion with the inclusion of the mechanical since elevator overruns typically and so it would probably be garage at 35 feet maximum all inclusive of solar panels and and stop it there and and I would agree maker uh, seconder that's fine and then the second issue I just did want to alert underground parking for the garage was not specifically studied in the environmental reviews so that's why my language was with underground parking possible with subsequent review because there would need to be some level of environmental analysis to be brought back so I, I wanted to clarify why I chose that language all right I understand Ms. Jensen I understand but can I ask a question of Mr. Moose um, Mr. Moose does that affect our certification of the EIR as it is the uh, EIR does not look at a scenario of an underground parking garage that that doesn't make it an inadequate EIR what it doesn't do however is uh, provide the analysis of the uh, new version of the project that, that uh, you're creating if it, it is to include underground garage 
Uh, it sounds like that's an option. That's something that could happen. And so I think if the applicant uh, determined that they want to pursue that as a means of living within the height limitation, they would have they would have to approach the town about doing some supplemental environmental analysis. That might well take the form of an addendum to this EIR, depending on whether that would show new significant effects that could not be mitigated. My, my expectation would be that they probably could be mitigated to a less than significant level, but we don't have that analysis right now. Uh, that satisfies my question, and I'd be still prepared to continue with my second. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Przinski. And, and just final clarification. So with the, the new language or the original language, um, we are actually allowing for the elevator to come to the top floor. That would be a nice thing. Correct. Yeah. Um, I saw two nods from the maker and the seconder. I can uh, let me rewrite that, uh, reread that, just so there's no confusion. Garage would be limited to 35 feet maximum, inclusive of solar panels, with underground parking possible with subsequent review. That's consistent with uh, where I want to go, Ms. Jensen. That's what I understood, yes. Mr. Brzezinski? Further discussion? All right, I'm gonna call the motion. Everybody in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. All right, we Excuse have me, four Mayor. one. I'm sorry, we do have to ask the clerk to read the title and then you'll have to re-vote. Um, you waived the reading of the ordinance. We did not ask the clerk to I did to not read see title. that in your listing here. So what would you- My so, apologies. All right. Ordinance of the Town of Las Gatas rescinding ordinances 1247, 1366, and 1955, and amending the zoning ordinance affecting a zone change from CMPD to CMPD at 90 through 160 Albright Way and 14600 Winchester Boulevard. Thank you. All right, we have uh, the reading. Uh, we have a motion on the table. Everybody in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Passes 4-1, the vice mayor voting no. Uh, that is the last item on our agenda. This meeting is adjourned.